Hoost von Ghent goes by a number of names. Hoostus von Ghent, or Hoos, or Hoostus von Wassenhoven. He's recorded in 1460 in the Antwerp Painters Guild. So presumably he was born in Wassenhove and uh, moved and worked in Antwerp. And then in 1464, he is recorded as a master at Ghent. So he has moved to Ghent. Uh, he also seems to have known some uh, famous artists such as uh, Hugo van der Hoos and uh, the miniature is Simon Baining because he sponsored their guild entry in 1465 for Hugo van der Hoos, 1468 for Simon Baining. And then he moved to Italy in somewhere around 1469 to 70. He is recorded in Urbino at the court of Federico de Montefeltro as Giusto da Guanto, which is Hus von Ghent in uh, Italian. There are only two uh, extant paintings by Hus von Ghent um, that were painted before he moved to Italy, and this is one of them. Uh, it is an Adoration of the Magi in the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York, and it doesn't have a date on it, uh, but uh, they dated around 1465. This is a very rare survival of tempera on linen. Now, there were undoubtedly more paintings uh, that were painted on cloth or on canvas, um, but they have perished. Uh, and so relative to the uh, panel paintings, uh, we have very, very few of these. There are, for example, two of uh, these uh, paintings on uh, cloth, on canvas, um, by Dirk Bouts. And here we have one by Hus von Ghent. You can see that his figure style features long, lean, slender figures. And here they seem to be uh, occupying a, a, a spacious setting. There's a uh, room between each of the figures. This is, as we said, an adoration of the Magi, and you can see that the eldest Magus, uh, as is traditional, kneels before the Christ child. The Magi show three different ages. The oldest Magus kneeling, uh, behind him stands the middle-aged Magus, and uh, a little bit to the left we have this young man who is the Magus, and he seems to be quite swarthy. It's um, quite possible that he's intended to be an African Magus, uh, and it certainly looks like his servant uh, is uh, uh, an African. Um, his servant is offering him this beautiful vessel. Uh, and I wanted to give you a detail of it, but when I tried to blow it up, uh, it became pixelated. Uh, so I'll just have to tell you about it. At the very top of this, there is a ornament showing a pelican piercing its breast. This is called the pelican in its piety. And uh, as you'll remember, we talked about this when we looked at Jan van Eyck's Ghent altarpiece. Uh, the pelican pierces its breast to feed its young with its own blood. And it is a symbol of Christ's sacrificial death, which is reenacted in the Mass. And this painting has been interpreted uh, with Eucharistic references. Many paintings of the Adoration of the Magi seem to have references to the Mass, to the Eucharist, uh, to the sacrificial death of Christ that is reenacted in the sacrament of the bread and wine. So here we see uh, not only this pelican ornament, but the vessel that is the gift that the Magus is going to offer to the Christ child resembles a chiborium. Uh, the vessel which would hold the consecrated bread and be placed uh, in the uh, tabernacle of the sacrament or be on display in its own right. And the, we see a table holding bread and wine. There are some details. 
The other Ghent altar piece uh, is this uh, painting of the crucifixion, like crucifixion tri triptych or a Calvary scene. And this is the other painting that we know of by Hus van Ghent that was painted in the lowlands in Flanders uh, before he went to Italy. Um, you can see they're dating it just right before he went, about 1467 to 69. Now, Generally, this is attributed to Hus von Ghent. Uh, there has been, however, uh, a more recent article that thinks that it is not by him, but by Hugo von der Hus, uh, and that it is an early painting uh, by Hugo von der Hus. Um, I think we'll, for the purposes of the class, uh, you know, uh, we'll let you make your, up your own mind, uh, and if somebody does attribute it to Hugo on an exam, I will allow it. But um, I think we'll stick with the traditional attribution for now. Oh, who's von Ghent? I call this the other Ghent altarpiece. There, of course, are many altarpieces in Ghent, uh, but these are two uh, famous ones. The Ghent altarpiece, of course, uh, by Jan van Eyck, uh, the, uh, that uh, features the adoration of the mystic lamb, and that is in the Church of St. Bavos in Ghent, and was originally placed in the chapel of uh, Jodicus Witt uh, that surrounds the choir. Um, it now, of course, has been moved to the other side of the church and uh, you know, access is limited and you know, the tourists have to go in and see it under a, in a huge glass case, as it were. Uh, this Ghent altarpiece, because it is in Ghent, is in the same church. It's in uh, the Church of St. Bavos and it is uh, displayed in the crypt. Uh, where its original place was, well, it wasn't originally in the crypt of St. Bavos, let's just say that. You look at this and you see this spacious landscape. Um, it has been suggested that Hus van Ghent may have trained with Dirk Bouts. Now, that's not documented. That's just based on similarities with his work. Um, but remember how Bouts would make, um, would lead you back into space by having the overlapping uh, uh, hills and uh, the figures, of course, that get smaller and smaller, which would be uh, pretty much uh, natural uh, to, to show. Uh, and so there is something similar in the fact that he does use these hills as uh, you know, ways to draw you back into space. They sort of mark each side, and you're looking through a valley uh, that leads you back uh, further and further into space. And of course, you have these groups of figures in the foreground, a little bit further back, and the middle ground, and a little bit more distant. Um, I don't think this proves uh, that uh, Bouts was his teacher. Uh, it's uh, a way of showing depth, and uh, I'll let you be the judge for that. And here we see the uh, central scene, the crucifixion, or Calvary, uh, with Christ on the cross, raised up you know, very high, uh, silhouetted against the blue sky with these uh, clouds and the uh, two thieves are uh, lowered down. You'll notice that the good thief, the good thief is the thief who accepts Christ and Christ says today you'll be with me in paradise um, and he is facing Christ and Christ's head is inclined toward him. Uh, traditionally the good thief is always on Christ's right and the bad thief is on the sinister side, the left side, and he's uh, looking down and away from Christ. As in, what, virtually all of the Calvary scenes, a crucifixion with all of the attendant figures, rather than one that just, say, has Mary and John, um, Virtually all of these divide up the good people and the bad people. You've got uh, uh, Mary, uh, the holy women, John on Christ's right, that'd be our left, but Christ's right, and the bad guys, as it were, the, uh, the Romans and the, uh, uh, the tormentors. Uh, and here uh, we have two figures right under the, cro right under the cross. Uh, one of them would undoubtedly be Longinus, uh, the centurion who um, pierces Christ's side. 
Um, and there was a legend that he was blind. I don't think you could have a blind centurion, to be perfectly frank. Um, but um, the legend says that he was blind and droplets of Christ's blood went into his eyes and he could see. And he says, truly, this must be the Son of God. Well, the Bible says that he says this. Uh, they don't name him. Uh, and they don't have the legend of the curing of blindness with the blood, but just that he recognizes Christ on the cross and says, truly, this must be the Son of God. Who's the other figure? Probably Pilate, but uh, he's certainly richly dressed. Uh, I suppose it could be uh, one of the uh, Jewish priests. Oh, but uh, he doesn't seem to be dressed like a priest. It's just this very rich robe. So probably Pilate. And here we see a uh, detail of the distant mountain. And a close-up of Mary and the holy women. Mary has collapsed. She suffers as the theologians say, in her heart or in her soul, as Christ suffers in his body. And there's actually two ways of showing Mary under the cross. Uh, one is the Stabat Mater, the standing mother, and there is a hymn by that name, the Stabat Mater. Um, and Mary stands erect under the cross, erect in faith. And then there's this other idea that comes in um, I guess with the late Middle Ages, show, with effective piety, with the idea of showing um, the suffering of Christ uh, and the suffering of Mary. And as you can see, she has just simply collapsed uh, with the pain of seeing her son on the cross and dying. Now, as you look at the entire triptych, You'll see that the landscape seems to be continuous, uh, that the, uh, the hills on either side seem to continue into the side uh, panels. However, the side panels contain scenes from the Old Testament. And these are uh, what we call types or prefigurations or typology uh, that the idea was, uh, according to Christian theologians, that God had placed within history, within the Bible, uh, events that prefigured or were a kind of uh, omen or pointed to uh, what would be coming with the coming of Christ. And we've talked about this before, uh, and here we're going to see two uh, Old Testament types. As we look at it, the left side, uh, we see a scene from Exodus 15. Now, this is uh, a scene that we don't see a lot in art. It's Moses sweetening the bitter waters of Marah. We do see scenes more frequently of Moses striking the rock and water coming from it. Uh, but on this case, it's the, you know, the, the bitter waters, the probably poisonous waters, uh, that have to be sweetened so that they are fit for human consumption. And you would see up in uh, the little uh, round shape that is the top of the altarpiece, you have God the Father, half length, uh, pointing down, giving uh, Moses orders. And Moses, with this very, very long uh, staff, has uh, placed it in the water to purify it. Uh, the Israelites are grouped uh, around him. You have uh, some people far in the distance, uh, some uh, just beside him. And then you have the scene of people drinking um, right in the foreground. Now, Moses is in some sense a prefiguration of Christ. He is the lawgiver, and uh, Christ is uh, the, uh, the person who fulfills the law, as it were. On the other side, on the right uh, wing or side panel, uh, we see the image of, of Moses raising the brazen serpent, or just sometimes just called the brazen serpent, or the serpent of brass. 
And this is told in Numbers 21. It says, So Moses made a brass snake and put it up on a pole. Then when anyone was bitten by a snake and looked at the bronze snake, he lived. Sometimes the snake is translated, the uh, adjective is translated bronze, sometimes brass. Uh, but at any rate, uh, metal in any case. Uh, the Israelites were affected by a plague. They were being bitten by serpents, which made them sick, and they would die. And so God commands uh, Moses uh, to place a bronze, a brazen, a metal uh, image of a snake uh, so up on uh, this high, as you can see, this cross. Uh, it looks like a kind of taw-shaped cross. And everyone would look up, and they would live. They would be saved from you know, death by snake bite. Um, so raising up the snake on a cross and then people being saved uh, when they look at it was considered to be a prefiguration of the crucifixion itself. And this is explicit in the New Testament. Uh, John, in the third chapter in the uh, Gospel of St. John, uh, says, just as Moses lifted up the snake in the desert, so the Son of Man must be lifted up that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. And the lifted up was interpreted as being lifted up on the cross. Okay, who's von Gett? goes down to Italy. We don't know if he was invited down. We don't know what the circumstances were, but we do know that he worked uh, at the court of Urbino uh, for the Duke of Urbino, Federigo da Montefeltro. And the work that we're going to show you uh, first was created for Federico de Montefeltro and for the confraternity of the Corpus Domini, the body of the Lord. And so here we see a Last Supper, but it's not Jesus and the apostles seated at the table. It's actually the first communion of the apostles. Uh, Jesus is getting up and walking around. It's a more active um, institution of the Eucharist or communion of the apostles uh, than, uh, for example, Dirk Bouts. Uh, so this has more action in it. Christ is actually uh, standing, walking. And as you can see, there's uh, two angels hovering above. It seems to be taking place in a church, uh, possibly the chapel uh, where this would have been hung, uh, the chapel for the confraternity. And of course, as this takes place in a church, in a chapel, the table of the Last Supper uh, serves as what an altar, of course. So this could be called a Last Supper, although, as you see, they're not really eating uh, the supper. Uh, it is an institution of the Eucharist or a First Communion. And very explicitly, Christ places the host, this uh, wafer of bread, in the mouth of one of the kneeling apostles. And then if you look at the table, you see that resting on the table is a chalice, the chalice of the wine, and laid out are uh, little round flat circles. These are the wafers of the host. Now, we see the apostles kneeling to receive communion, but if you look in um, at our right, uh, looking a little further behind the apostles, uh, you see some standing figures. And these are believed to be uh, contemporary people. I, I don't think we have to say believed. These are portraits of contemporary people. Uh, Federico de Montefeltro is there uh, with a very characteristic portrait, which I will show you later in another picture. Uh, and then there is this man in brocade with his hand uh, to his breast, uh, sort of a exotic looking uh, uh, headgear. This is believed to be the Persian ambassador uh, who was at the court of Urbino at the time and converted to Christianity. And then sort of back between those figures, a little further back, 
between the columns, we see a picture of a woman holding a baby. And this is the posthumous portrait of Batista Sforza. Um, and her son, not posthumously, her baby, uh, whom she's holding. Uh, Batista Sforza was the wife of Federica de Montefeltro. And she died, I believe, in childbirth, uh, giving birth to his son and heir, Guidobaldo. Uh, and Federico must have wanted to honor her uh, because he had a posthumous portrait painted of her uh, by Piero della Francesca, the Italian painter, and seemed to have wanted to have included her, even though she was had already died, uh, in this painting. And here we see another portrait of Federico de Montefeltro, uh, the Duca of Urbino, and we see his son, Guidobaldo, uh, growing up a little bit here. Uh, so we're dating it a little bit later, 1475. He's still a child, but not a baby anymore. And this is a, a wonderful uh, portrait of the Duke. Uh, in fact, about 1475 is when he was named Duke. Uh, and you can see him here reading. He collected manuscript, illuminated manuscripts, so he had a fine library. And he wanted to show that, you know, he was every inch, you know, sort of like you say, the ideal Renaissance prince. Uh, he's, he had court painters, uh, people who uh, did, you know, wonderful art for him. Uh, Piero della Francesca for one, and calls down Hus von Ghent to Urbino. Uh, he's one of these uh, Italian uh, art patrons who uh, just love the new style uh, that's taking place in Flanders. And he imports his own Flemish artist. Uh, as you can also see, he has, is wearing armor and he has a helmet there. Uh, that's essentially how he made his fortune and uh, gained his, uh, well, that's, what that's essentially how he made his fortune. He was actually a younger son um, and, of course, became a condottiere or a uh, mercenary general. He was, even as a duke, uh, the general for both uh, Milan, the Duke of Milan, and uh, for the Pope. And he got a really fabulous salary from both of them, uh, sort of to be on call in case they needed to make war. And then if he actually had to fight, he got even more money. Uh, the wonderful thing about this is he didn't have to have high taxes, even though he was spending money to build a beautiful palazzo, uh, to uh, commission all of this artwork, uh, to have illuminated manuscripts painted for him. Uh, his people really liked that. And in fact, they had a strong contrast. His older brother had been the Marchese of Urbino, and evidently he was so cruel and um, just a horrible ruler that the people actually rose up and killed him. Now, Federico wasn't around at the time. He was off doing something else, maybe something military. And he returns, and of course the doors, like, uh, rather the gates of the city are closed, and essentially the people make a deal with him. Uh, they say, if there are no reprisals, you know, you do not make any reprisals for the death of your brother. We'll let you be the new Duke of Urbino. You know, you had to promise to be a better ruler. So he had a rather interesting example in front of him. He must have agreed with them or something because he was by all uh, accounts for the time a very good ruler. And uh, the fact that uh, his people were not overly taxed was also a note in his favor, uh, certainly for his popularity. Uh, this is the very famous portrait of uh, Federico de Montefeltro, uh, painted by Piero della de Francesca. 
uh, probably uh, close to the same time as this other uh, work, uh, although neither of them are dated. Uh, and you can see that there is a very recognizable physiognomy here. Um, the Duke, as we said, was a soldier. He was a military person, and one way you honed your skills uh, for fighting was to joust. And in a joust, he had a lance uh, penetrated his eye, fortunately did not go into the brain, put out one eye, and broke his nose. And so he's always portrayed in profile. Uh, so I guess you can't see the bad eye. You always do see the broken nose, of course. And because he is so recognizable, we have no uh, problem with the identifying portraits of uh, Federico de Montefeltro. Uh, and here we see him in a, uh, as a donor in a, uh, another painting by Piero della Francesca, a Madonna with Saints. In his palace, in his palace at Urbino, Federico de Montefeltro had a studiola, a study. And here's a picture of it. Uh, it had these beautiful intarsia, inlaid wooden uh, walls that are, I think they're book presses, I think they're actually cupboards here. Uh, and they have these wonderful illusionistic scenes, of the illusionistic still life and views uh, of a, a distant city or landscape, uh, all laid out in um, intarsia, in inlaid wood. But what we're looking at here are the pictures that are, as you can see, uh, going around the uh, upper part of the wall. And in this picture, you can see that some of them are in black and white. Those are because uh, they are uh, represented with a reproduction. Uh, and some of them are in Urbino still, and some of them now are in Paris in the, uh, the Louvre. And these are paintings of famous men. Uh, some of them are um, classical figures. Some of them are ecclesiastical figures. Uh, some of them are contemporaries of people. Uh, Dante's there, for example. And I'll show you somebody else. Uh, now, we're not always sure who painted them. Hus van Ghent had a, another expatriate uh, painter uh, that uh, uh, also was painting these, and that was Pedro Berenguetti from Spain. And so, you know, we just are not sure which paintings were by which artist, although sometimes uh, they are attributed to one or the other. Uh, here's just some of the examples. Here is his example of uh, Plato and Aristotle. And as you can see, you have this uh, foreshortened arm with uh, Aristotle and uh, you know, Plato has his arm outstretched as he's showing you uh, the book of writings. Um, it was in the 15th century that Plato's dialogues, that Plato's writings uh, first were imported into Western Europe. Uh, in the Greek, of course, there was only one Platonic dialogue that had been known in the West during the Middle Ages, and that's the Timaeus. Uh, here we have Ptolemy. Uh, you've heard of the Ptolemaic universe, perhaps, the geocentric universe, uh, the idea of how the heavens were uh, constructed, uh, and the, the, uh, the idea of a series of construct, uh, concentric circles uh, around the earth and the sun going around the earth because that's, that's what it looks like. And of course, for centuries and centuries, that is what is, was believed. Uh, there's Virgil uh, holding uh, one of his books and crowned with laurel. And here is a contemporary person, um, Vittorino da Feltro. He was a humanist scholar, but he was also an educator. Uh, he's very, very famous as a teacher. Uh, he was hired by the Gonzagas of Mantua to teach their children, not only the male children, but also the daughters of the house. 
he had a very fine scholar in uh, Cecilia Gonzaga. Uh, in fact, when she's about six years old, he writes that uh, she's mastered Latin and now he has to find a primer in Greek to start teaching her Greek when she's going she's about six or seven years old. Uh, he had all sorts of wonderful educational ideas. Uh, he thought that you know education should be a joy. And so he called the school at the court of Urbino the House of Joy. Now I want to show you two more uh, paintings by Hus van Ghent and how different that style is from the style that we saw uh, with the uh, paintings that he had done in the Netherlands. He's come down to Italy and he has adopted aspects of the Italian style while at the same time keeping uh, the, uh, the Netherlandish detail and uh, the use of uh, the luminosity of oil paint. Uh, so it's like the best of both worlds, if you will. Uh, these are from a series of paintings of the liberal arts and we're looking at music and at rhetoric. Uh, and the female figures are the personification of, in this case, music and rhetoric. You can see that music is holding, uh, can't see which is, just holding a book uh, or a collection, perhaps, of music, and uh, is uh, pointing to uh, this portable organ down below. And rhetoric is pointing to the book. And they are both enthroned uh, in these uh, classical and uh, somewhat fantastical uh, thrones of stone. Now, there's a tradition of showing personifications uh, as female figures and here enthroned. And uh, there is some by Palai Wolo and also uh, uh, Botticelli. I'm just showing you Botticelli's fortitude in uh, one of these elaborate uh, classicizing stone thrones. And here we see a detail of rhetoric. And you see there, you know, it's the figure's volumetric. It's uh, lighted softly. You have this beautiful foreshortening. It seems to be very, very solid. Uh, and yet there are all of these uh, wonderful details of light shining off the jewels, off the figure. Uh, the Netherlandish naturalistic detail combined with uh, the Italian monumentality.